So when I was in first grade, my parents finally caved and they got my brother and I an original Nintendo. Now we had been wanting one for a while, but and it had been out for just a little bit, but we finally got it. And the original Nintendo, for those of you who were around and kids in the 80s, you probably remember some of this. It came, there are different versions you could get, but you could get the box that had the, the dual game in it, which I have right here. I actually have the one I had when we first got it. So uh, it had Mario and Duck Hunt, if you remember that. And it came with the little zapper gun. Remember that? Okay. So you got that, first grade, and uh, that was a blast. Played it a lot and uh, had a lot of fun. But then what had happened was that Christmas, my uncle who lived in Texas, he had a son who was much older than me, and the Nintendo had been out for just a little bit, and so he got all these games, and he, he grew sick of it pretty quick. So my uncle took all my, my cousin's old games, and he shipped them to our house, and that was a Christmas present. And there were so many amazing Nintendo games that we got that Christmas, and I, I have them, some of them in this, in this box. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, they're classics. Can I just talk about them for a second? Is this okay? All right. So we have uh, the original... Legend of Zelda, amazing game. Gold, right, classic. Uh, Kung Fu, it's a great game. Tetris, also classic. Uh, everybody remembers Contra. This game was amazing. I still remember the code. You guys remember the code to get 30 guys? Remember it's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, B, A, select, start? No, am I, am I losing you? Okay. Uh, let's see. Tech Mobile, I mean, come on. Great. Uh, I, Bible adventures, I threw this in here because I'm a pastor and I feel like I need to kind of like balance out what I'm talking about right now so it's more spiritual. So terrible game, but I, I brought it. Uh, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, great game. Yep, good one. But of all the games that we had, do you want to know what my favorite game of all time is? And you may disagree, that's okay. Favorite game of all time is Mario 3. Mario 3 is amazing. Now you can disagree with me, okay, that's all right. We can still be friends. Um, you can disagree with me. You'll be wrong if you disagree with me, but you can disagree. Mario 3 was amazing. I still remember when we had got Mario 3 for the first time, right? And, and I got it out and we got ready to put it in the Nintendo. And so what do you do? You blow in it first, right? That's what you always had to do to make sure it worked. Sometimes you put your shirt over it and blew in it that way so no spit got in the cartridge. And then you put it in and the opening screen came up and then you started off in World 1, the first level, remember? And you get the leaf and if you get the leaf and you run really fast, it does a little whistle sound and you fly. And uh, if you get the leaf in World 1, that means you can get two warp whistles. Anybody tracking with me on this? No? Am I, is it just me? Okay, you get two warp whistles in World 1. Then if you beat World 1, you can warp all the way to World 8. And then in World 8, that's the final world, you play all these levels and you get to the end and there's Bowser. He's the bad guy. And it was just always so intense when you finally got to the point where you're playing Bowser and, and you have, you know, the princess is at stake. You got to save the princess. And so you're playing. And I just remember being so excited and kind of nervous about the end. And sometimes when I would play Mario 3, I could play it all the way through and beat it. And that was awesome. But there were other times where as I was playing Mario 3, I'd get toward the, toward the end and it seemed like something happened that prevented me from beating the game. And maybe you're familiar with this. This happens at times. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, strange things would start to appear on the screen. Maybe there'd be some like lines that would go up and down, or, or eventually, sometimes like all these random squares would just appear, and like it just looked funny, and it was it was glitchy, right? The, the original Nintendo was glitchy, which is why you had to blow in it to get it to work, and which is why halfway through games, sometimes it would just start doing weird things. And when that happened, when a game got glitchy on Nintendo, it's not like you could save where you're at and then start over from World 8, right? Because original Nintendo, you couldn't save on these cartridges. So you just had to play until you got there. So I was stuck and there was only really one thing I could do. You hit the reset button and you start over. And if it's still glitchy, you might have to pull it out and blow it again. But either way, you get the point. You hit the reset button and you have to start over. That's just how it worked. And you know, as I think about just these old school games like that, it reminded me of something. It reminds me a little bit about something else in life. You know, in life, we always go into things, we begin to pursue things, and we have the very best intentions, don't we? Let me give you some examples. You got married, right, because you thought, man, you loved each other, you're just going to settle down, you're going to live happily ever after, you'll ride off into the sunset, and life will be bliss 
forever. You have these best intentions and expectations for marriage. Or, or maybe for some of you, you know, in your faith journey, you got to a point where you were just so excited about your faith, your faith was so strong and zealous that you jumped in and got involved in the church and you started serving the Lord and serving people and you're just on fire for Jesus. Or maybe some of us, you know, you, you had this dream job that you worked super hard to get and you went through school and you did all these steps to get this job because you thought when you got that job, you're finally going to be content, you're going to be happy and satisfied and life is going to be great for you. But the truth is, so often we go into these things with the very best intentions and expectations, but over time, stuff happens. Things happen that we didn't expect we encounter problems that we didn't anticipate when we started. See, the truth is life can be pretty glitchy sometimes. Life can be full of glitches and challenges and trials and hardships. And let me give you some examples of what that looks like. That marriage that you were so excited about that you thought you would live happily ever after, you go into that and after a couple years you begin to have fighting and problems and issues and pretty soon your marriage is starting to crumble and it's not what you thought it would be. For many of you, maybe even in your faith, there was a point in your spiritual life where you dove in and you got involved, but over time, some of those feelings began to fade. Maybe even your heart was filled with some doubt, and so you step back a little bit and you're no longer involved the same way. Things didn't work out the way that you had anticipated. Maybe for some of you, that dream job that you worked really hard to get that you thought would make you content and satisfied, the moment you got it, you realize that it's continuing to disappoint and there are issues at work and now you're just walking around feeling depressed or upset about the, the, this, this job that you've inherited. You see, there are times in life for all of us where we experience unexpected glitches and problems. And when that happens, what do we do about it? Do we just keep plugging away, doing the same thing? Yeah, there are glitches and problems, but I guess we're just going to have to deal with it. Do we keep playing the game like we were? Or instead, maybe do we say, no, I'm done with this, and we just quit. We throw in the towel. Is that what we do? Do we just say, oh, I'm going to abandon my marriage. It's not working out the way I expected. I'm going to abandon my faith. I'm going to abandon this job. Is that what we do? Are these really our only two options? Keep things the same or quit? I don't think so. I don't believe these are our only two options. In fact, I believe that God's word, scripture, gives us another option to consider. What if instead of just doing things the way we've always done them and, and just realizing the fact that things are broken and we're not going to make any changes, or quitting, throwing in the towel, what if God wants us to stop for a moment, hit the reset button, and start all over, but with a mindset that's focused on what he desires instead of what we want to do? What if God wants to give us the chance in whatever we're facing right now to stop and hit reset? You know, when I open my Bible, I read that God's mercies are new every morning, which tells me that our God is a God of second chances. He's always giving us an opportunity to stop, hit reset, and start over. And so maybe it's time for you to consider that. Instead of just letting things continue to go the way they've always went and just living with it, or instead of throwing in the towel with your marriage or your job or your faith, maybe it's time for you to stop and hit reset and consider that God has a better approach with whatever area of life you're experiencing hardship. Maybe it's time to start doing things his way. And so here at FBC, that's what we're going to focus on for the next several weeks. We're doing a brand new sermon series here called Reset. It's all about those areas of life where we go into them with great expectations and intentions and encounter problems and glitches. It's all about stopping, hitting the reset button and saying, Lord, what do you want in this area of my life? Because I want to do things your way, not my way. My way is not working out anymore. I want to turn to you. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to look at a handful of different topics that we all face in life. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about finances. We're going to talk about relationships. A bunch of things we're going to talk about. But this morning, we're going to kick things off by talking about the topic of work. The topic of work. And so if you want to join me with that, go ahead and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. 
Now, just so you know, if you came here this morning and you don't own a physical Bible and there's a Bible in front of you, take it home with you. We'd love for you to have a Bible this morning. Also, uh, if you're tuning in online, you can go to our mobile app. There's a built-in Bible there. Uh, But Genesis 2 is where we're at. Now, the book of Genesis is the very first book of your Bible. So if you pull out your Bibles, it's the very beginning. You might have some notes or something at the beginning, but right after that, Genesis 2 is where we're at. And as you're turning there, you might be wondering now, Pastor Joe, why are we talking about work this morning? In fact, there are some other things that you mentioned that really appealed to us. In fact, maybe you saw the promotion that we put out there that we're doing this series, and maybe you thought, oh, great, this is the perfect series for me. I'm having relationship problems. I'm going to show up on the first Sunday and hear about the relationship stuff. Well, we're not doing that this week. We're talking about work this week. So if you want to hear about relationships, I'm not going to tell you which sermon that's going to be. You just have to come back every single week and hope that it's the right one, okay? So today we're talking about work, and so why are we talking about work? Well, the truth is, Work, it encompasses a major portion of our lives. So much of your life is revolved around this topic of work. Uh, It it doesn't matter what kind of work you do. It doesn't matter if you're a student, so your work is really to do the homework that your teacher uh, gives you to do, or if you're a construction worker, or if you're a lawyer, or a doctor, or you're a stay-at-home parent, and your work is in the home and with kids and with the, the house. Whatever you do, any kind of work that you do, it doesn't really matter. We all do a lot of it. That's the point. We all have something that we're responsible for doing. All of us. Work is something that all of us have to do. In fact, studies say that that more than one-third of your life will be spent working. Just think about that for a moment. More than one-third of your life will be spent working. That's a lot of time. In fact, studies tell us that in America, the average person in the U.S., they will spend around 30 years of their life working. Think about that. That is a significant portion of your life, a large chunk of time to do something, which means if you're having problems at work or with your work that you do, then you're having problems with your life because one-third of your life, 30 years, is devoted to this one thing. And if you have problems there, it affects your whole life. In fact, let me just suggest this morning that maybe if you came here and you're like, you know, Pastor Joe, I was really hoping for the relationship message. I'm a little disappointed. Let me just begin by saying this, that if you're having problems with work, That will affect problems in your relationship. It will affect problems with your kids. It will affect problems with every area of your life because it's a big part of your life. It's going to impact everything. And so if you're having problems with work, then it needs to be addressed. It needs to be examined. If you're having issues, then you need to stop this morning, pause for a second, hit the reset button, and look at work from God's perspective. And so that's what we're going to do together. But before we jump in and look at the problems with work, I just want to begin by doing something a little more foundational to help us understand what work is, where it came from, why it exists. You see, work is not something that we created. Work is something that God created. It was something that he created from the very beginning. And work is something that's designed for our good. Work is a very good thing. That's what we see in the beginning of the Bible. And so that's what we're going to look at first. So if you're in Genesis chapter 2, let's dive in. The first section I want to talk about, number one, is the plan for work. The plan for work. Now, if you know where the Bible begins, it begins with the story of creation. You're in chapter 2, but if you just look at chapter 1 briefly, you'll see that the Bible describes the first six days of creation in chapter 1. In the first six days, God creates everything that exists in the beginning of chapter 2. It's the seventh day where God rests, and then you move into the rest of chapter 2. Now, in those first six days, God creates everything, but in chapter 2, what God does is he now zooms in, And he looks at the creation story from a different vantage point and elaborates on it. Sometimes we get confused in the story of the Bible that in Genesis 1, God creates everything. But Genesis 2, it seems like he recreates stuff. It's almost like people talk about gap theories and all this stuff. Really what the author is doing of Genesis, he's zooming in and he's describing the day of creation when humans were created in detail. That's what he's doing. And you'll see this in the text. So notice what it says in verses 5 through 7. It says, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, this is chapter 2. And no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. So notice how there's no man. Well, that's just because the author's backing up, zooming in, and retelling the story of creation, the creation of man. It says, And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man 
of dust from the, from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now, notice in our text how God creates humanity. It says that he was formed from the dust of the ground. Now, if, though, and if anybody here has ever done pottery of any sort, right? you take the raw material, the clay, and what you do is you begin to shape it into something. And really, this is what God's doing in Genesis chapter 2. He's taking the dust, which if you notice in the narrative, has now been saturated by this mist. So it's wet, it's moist. He's taking mud, and he's sculpting Adam. He's sculpting man. And what he does is when he sculpts man, he breathes into man the breath of life. This is the description we get in Genesis of how the human was created. But notice uh, here in the beginning also, I just want to mention this. Just this is free of charge, okay? Before humans are created, what is God doing? What is he doing to make humans? He's working. God, in the very beginning, he's a God who's working. He shapes humans. God is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Literally, he got his hands dirty when making us. So God is working, he creates the human, and if you notice, that's, that's the how. But then there's a little glimpse as to why he makes humans. Notice how it says that before humans were created, there's a little um, hint there. It says there was no man to work the ground. You see, from the very beginning, God's intention for humanity was to make people with a function. People with a a role, a responsibility, a task. He endowed us from the very beginning with a deep sense of purpose. We were created from day one to do something. You and I were created to work. That's why God made us. In fact, if you look at verse 15 of the text, notice what it says. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Work. Work. That's why he created him and put him in the garden. It was so Adam could work. Sometimes we tell people, in fact, I've said this too, that God created us because he wanted to have a relationship with somebody. Well, God really wanted a relationship with somebody. And so God created humans so we could be like in a relationship with God. and We could satisfy that need that God had as if God is some cosmic lonely guy who just needs some friends. Doesn't it sound funny when we actually think about it realistically? God doesn't just need more friends. God was perfectly content in the Godhead, pouring into one another in love and friendship and relationship. God needs nothing from us. You didn't need a friend. That's not why you were created. God created us to work, but to work in relationship with him and partnership with him. Part of the plan for all creation, we're we're, we're partners with God and working And doing things. In Genesis, God is described as the one overseeing all of the created order. And we're described as the ones who are participating in that effort. We're given jobs, tasks for his glory forever and ever. That was part of the plan from the beginning. And it was an awesome plan too. Because that kind of work that God gave to Adam and Eve, it was rewarding. It was fulfilling. It was joyous work. It was great kind of work. It wasn't burdensome at all. They're given all these tasks in the garden, and it was a wonderful time. It was such a blessing for Adam and Eve. In the very beginning, everything about work was perfect. But then comes Genesis chapter 3. And everything perfect about work, it begins to unravel in Genesis chapter 3. And so the next thing we're going to see, number one, after the problem, or plan plan for work, number two, it's the problem with work. The problem with work. Now, we're not going to spend very long on this section. We're going to go pretty quick. Many of us know what happens in Genesis chapter 3, but if you don't know, you can look at it yourself and read this later. Essentially, Adam and Eve, they're given a task to work in the garden. They're told that they can do all this work, and the only thing they shouldn't do is eat from the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the middle of the garden. And if they eat of it, they'll surely die. That's the consequence. That's the result of their sin. And Adam and Eve, instead of doing things and working God's way, they chose to make themselves the boss and do things their own way. They rebel against God. They eat the forbidden fruit. As a result, sin enters the world. And with the arrival of sin, a whole host of problems develop. Not only does sin lead to death, not only does sin separate us from a holy God, but sin affects work. 
The things that we're given to do on earth, they're now marred by sin. They're affected by sin. Notice what God tells Adam as a result of his sin in verses 17 through 19. He says, and to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. He says, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Notice here how there's nothing about work that's a blessing anymore. It's a burden. Thorns and thistles rising up, that's a way of telling us that now work is affected. The earth is cursed, and the activity that we're involved in, it's burdensome. Unlike the garden, which was wonderful and joyous in the beginning, now we have all sorts of issues and problems and challenges in work. All of work that we do today, it operates under a curse, which means by nature today, in your job, in the work you do around the house, in the work you do in the home, whatever it is that you do, whatever work you engage in, you will face problems. You'll face challenges. In fact, I want to mention just practically here a few pitfalls that we fall into when we face work. And so that's going to lead to the third point this morning. Point number three, the pitfalls of work. I'm going to give real practical examples from here on out for the rest of the message of of some of the things that we struggle with at work. The reality is because work is now cursed, because work is now burdensome, one of the things that many of us tend to do because of how hard work is and how difficult it is, is number one, we avoid work. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just in your mind and heart, how many of you, you avoid work quite a bit? Be real with yourself. I I can raise my hand. I avoid work. In fact, I've gotten really good sometimes at avoiding work. Just ask my wife. I've gotten really good at not seeing the the laundry basket full of unfolded clothes in the living room. I can walk past it a hundred times and I never saw it. I didn't even see it. Why didn't I see it? Well, because deep down, I don't want to do it. And I'm sensing that maybe you feel the same way if you just got a nudge from your spouse. Yeah, okay. That's either your spouse or the Holy Spirit, one of the two. We avoid work. From time to time, there's just things we just don't, we, we don't want to do. So what happens? We're lazy. And if you read through the scriptures, there are, there are indictment after indictment after indictment of people who don't work, where they avoid it, or they're lazy. In fact, read the Proverbs. There's dozens of Proverbs about the sluggard, about the lazy person, and what the result is of their life. Practically, if they walk around being lazy, according to the Bible, being lazy is a major pitfall. But we shouldn't avoid Work. In fact, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, I read from that earlier during the, the host announcements earlier, but Paul actually says at one point in there, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's a novel concept, isn't it? A lot of us need to read that again and again and again. Avoiding work is not what God designed, but it's what we often do. Because sin has affected work and it's affected our mindset of work. It's a common pitfall. That's one. Here's another pitfall that some of us fall into. We hate work. There are some of you out there right now who this is maybe the job you pursued and it's not going the way you thought. Or a lot of you who are like, you know, this is never the job I would have picked. It's just what landed on me and this is what I do. And I hate it. You loathe your work. You just don't want to do it. It just It's terrible. A number of you out there, right? You might work really hard. You're not lazy. You do your job. You do it well. But the bottom line is you're miserable when you do this. You hate your work. You have a terrible attitude with work. Uh, You know who you are. Some of us, right, we, we can't stand going to work. And because you hate what you're doing and you have a bad attitude, you tend to grumble all the time or complain all the time about what you do. Or maybe you come home and the first thing you do for the first hour every day is you just vent about all the things that you hate about work. And the problem with this is your hatred of work, it doesn't just affect you. You bleed over onto others. So you hate your job so much that now you take that burden and you put it on your spouse. 
Or you hate your job so much that you put it on your kids. And when they ask you a question, you snap on them because you're so grumpy because you hate your job. Do you see how this doesn't just affect you? When we hate work, we hurt everyone around us. And I'm feeling in the room that maybe some of you are resonating with that. This is not okay. It's a common pitfall. It's part of the curse. But it doesn't stop there. Not only is work burdensome for many of us, but there's also something else that happened as a result of sin to work. Work is not only a burden that we either hate or avoid, but work can also be a snare. In fact, there are some of us, just the way that we're wired and the things that we do, that we actually really love work. Maybe you really love what you do. But just because you love what you do and you love doing it doesn't mean that you're on the right side of this. You see, because of sin, work can be a snare. For us, many many of us, right, work ends up being a thing that becomes an idol in our life. At times, if we aren't careful, it becomes the most important thing for us. It's the number one priority in our life. For many of us, the pitfall is we worship work. We worship it, and when that happens, everyone else around us also suffers. Maybe some of you are facing that firsthand. You you poured so much into this job. You pour so much of yourself. In fact, man, especially for us guys, this is really a struggle because we are made with this, I think, this desire to, to do and to have meaning in what we do, so much so that our identity is rooted to our job. Have you noticed that? When you oftentimes, not always, but when you ask a female individual, hey, tell me about yourself, usually they'll lead with their family. You know, maybe their hobbies, and then we'll talk about work. But with guys, it's always the first thing. Work, what you do. That's because our identity is connected to what we do. And we're so engrossed in that, that as a result, we've neglected the relationship with our spouse. Or we've avoided having any kind of conversations with our kids because they're an inconvenience. They're the ones that are stopping me from getting more work done. Because the bottom line is, you worship work. It's the idol in your life. And in all three examples, whether you avoid work, hate work, or whether you worship it, you're in the wrong. It's the wrong approach, and it's all connected to sin. Each one of these pitfalls can be traced back to the garden. And if you have a problem with any one of these three, then just know you have a problem in your life. Because a third of your life is spent working. And so what do you do? Do you say, well, it is what it is, and you just keep doing things the same way? Do you say, you know what? You're right, Pastor Joe. I'm done with work forever. I'm quitting. Never doing another, another, never going to lift a finger again. Can you do that? No. So what do you do? I think the answer is you stop. You pause. You hit the reset button, and you say, Lord... Let me approach this in a way that honors you. What would you have me do in my work? How should I approach work in a way that pleases you and reflects your word? I believe the answer to our problems with work, how we make changes, is by looking to Jesus. By looking to the gospel. By looking to God's word. You know, when we look at God's word, not only did God create us, humans to work. He didn't just make Adam as someone who worked. He made the second Adam as a person who worked. Jesus. Jesus came, right? He took on human flesh. He was sent here. And Jesus came to do a specific task, a job, a work. He had a function, a purpose. God gave Jesus work to do, to carry out God's will. And Jesus talks about what God's will was, what that work was to do. Repeatedly throughout Scripture, Jesus says he came to sacrifice himself for sinners like me. He says the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to defeat the power of death. He came to reverse the curse in the garden. Jesus came to work. In fact, he didn't just come to work. Jesus came to embrace the most burdensome work the world has ever known. If you think your job is hard, imagine what it would be to come to be completely sinless and yet to take on the cross. 
to allow the penalty for sin to be placed upon your shoulders and suffering, hanging, and dying in the most agonizing way. That was the work that God gave Jesus to do. And yet he faced it. He faced it. Why? To fulfill the will of his Father and because of his deep love for us. Jesus accomplished the work of redemption so that we we don't have to work for salvation. He did that work for us, which is why at the end of his life, Jesus was able to, to pray to his Father and he was able to say, I've glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, Father. I finished my task. The finished work of cross means now that we have new life in Christ. We have unwavering hope in Jesus. We've been given a new identity. Your identity is not in what you do. Your identity is primarily in Christ if you're a Christian. It's rooted in him. And in light of the transformation that's taken place in us through what Jesus has done, God has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us grace beyond measure. And because of that, we have the opportunity now to live in a new kind of way, a way that's consistent with who we are in Christ. So we can hit the reset button because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, enabling us to live out this whole thing of work in a whole different way. And so because of that, we now can, can respond in a way that honors God. In fact, in the book of Colossians, Paul reminds us of this. He says, because you're united to Christ, because God has transformed who you are, your identity is in Christ. He says, put off the former ways of life and clothe yourself with Christ. Live in a way that's consistent with who you now are in Jesus. And so Paul, he gets real practical. He talks about marriage. He talks about parenting. But he also talks about our mindset toward work. Because of Jesus... We can approach work from a completely different perspective. So hit reset and now hear what God's word has to tell us about the way that we should work. This is the fourth point now. Number four, the priority in work. What's the priority that we should have as we work? Well, the Apostle Paul, he he tells us right here. He says, whatever you do, doesn't matter what you do. You could be a teacher. You could be a, a janitor. You could be an engineer. You could be a student, stay at home mom. You could be whatever. Doesn't matter what you do. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You see, when we stop and hit the reset button and clothe ourselves in Christ and look at work the way that God designed, we see that we have a greater priority in our work than just getting the job done or making a living or putting food on the table. There's a greater priority here, Paul says. Whatever you do, whatever occupation, whatever work you're involved in, you work for the Lord. Jesus is our priority in work. And when we hit reset and make Jesus our priority, I'm telling you, it's amazing how practical this gets because the areas of life where we tend to fall into that pit, those things begin to fade away. When we put the right perspective on work, just think about it for a moment. If you make Jesus the priority of work, it's hard to be lazy, right? Because who are you ultimately working for? It's for the pleasure of God. In fact, you have an incentive to work even harder because maybe you're working and you're kind of like, you know, I remember my first job at a grocery store, I was making, you know, peanuts, hardly anything. I remember my first week uh, of the summer, I worked like 45 hours or something like that. And I looked at my paycheck and I was like, this is how much you get for that much work and a little overtime. This is terrible. Maybe not want to work so hard. But when you work for the Lord, you know that from the Lord, right, you'll receive an inheritance. Your hard work will pay off in glory. And so he's incentivizing you. Listen, if you're somebody who wants to avoid work, just know that you're working for Jesus. And not only that, he's going to reward you for hard work. So work hard. Notice how it helps you with that pitfall? Let me give another example. Maybe you're the person who hates work. Well, if you think about this the right way, it's hard to hate work when all your work is directed toward Jesus. Some of you right now, you go to work and the people you work with, you can't stand. Or the person you work for drives you nuts. Now, you're a Christian, so you wouldn't use the word hate with them. But if we were to look at the recesses of your heart, that's the word you'd use. You hate your boss. Your boss drives you 
bonkers and you can't stand the person. I know what it's like to have a boss that I don't like or respect. In fact, I know what it's like to be a boss that probably others don't like or respect sometimes. We, we all struggle in this area, but the, the truth is, at the end of the day, your boss isn't really your boss. Know that. When you clothe yourself with Christ and look at this from a Christ-centered way, your boss isn't really your boss. You ultimately work for Jesus. He's the one who you work for. If all our work is for Jesus, then this isn't something that you go into and you just hate everybody around you because ultimately it's not about them. It's about him. And so see how that begins to help you when you're somebody who just hates your job? Work can become so much more joyful when you go, you know what, this is hard. I don't like some of the things that are going on. Even some of these people around here, they're really difficult. But you know what, I'm not working for them. I'm working for Jesus. You see where the source of joy can come from? Let me give you the last one. It's hard to make your work an idol and to worship it when the goal of your work is ultimately to honor and worship Jesus more than anything else. When Jesus becomes your priority at work, then hear this. Work is not the object of your worship. It's the means by which you worship. Let me say that again. Work is not the object of your worship. It's the means, the way in which you worship God. It's through your work. When Jesus is your priority, then your work is merely an occasion to bring glory to God. In fact, this is really our big idea this morning for anybody who's been struggling with work, for anybody who, who's at a point where they've realized that work is not the way that it should be, that a third of your life is devoted toward either avoiding work, hating work, or worshiping work. Listen, hit the reset button, and this is the big idea this morning. Make your work an opportunity for worship. Make your work an opportunity for worship. Don't waste a third of your life. Don't waste the third, whatever the you have left of those 30 years, don't waste them avoiding work, hating work, or worshiping work. Make Jesus the priority and make your work an opportunity to worship him and praise him. Redeem that. Don't waste your life. You know, I mentioned Last week in the message, we talked about the importance of sharing the good news with those around us. And I shared a story about how I have a friend and he's not a believer and I have this class and this class, one of the requirements was I need to talk to an unbeliever about Jesus. And so I chose my friend. I texted him last week. I said, hey, can we talk at some point? We scheduled the time and we talked on the phone for about an hour and a half this last week. So I was able to talk to him about Jesus, and it was a good conversation, largely. But when it got to the, to the real crux of the issue, when we got down to it, and I said, listen, this is the gospel. This is what it means to follow Jesus. What do you think about this? There were two barriers for my friend when it comes to following or, or believing in Christ. The first barrier for him was when he looked around at the world and saw how messed up it was, he had a hard time reconciling the fact that there is an all-powerful, loving God who allows things to be so difficult. Now, that's a big topic. The hard one to talk through. That was one. But maybe even bigger. His hang up, you want to know what it was? When he walks around in life and he goes to his job, which he doesn't like sometimes the things that go into his job, he meets all kinds of people and some of them are Christians. And they don't act any differently than anybody else. In fact, sometimes they act worse. And he encounters them at places like work. And he goes, yeah, well, listen, if there's really a God out there who is really rescuing people and transforming their life, why do I see all these Christians around me who are living just as bad or, or if not worse than the world? That gave me pause. Do you realize that when you go to work and you avoid things because you're lazy, or you just grumble and complain to everybody around you, or you're so consumed with it that everybody can see, man, that is your God. Do you see that, how that affects your testimony at work? People are watching us. And as I look at God's word and I realize that, listen, this whole perspective, when I make Jesus my priority, 
and when everything I do at work becomes an opportunity to worship God, that should be reflected in the way that I work in such a way that when people see Christians in the workforce, they should go, man, there must be something about that guy. Look at how great he is of an employee. Look how hard of a worker there. Look how he has everything in balance and does such a great job. There's something about that person that's different. Do you realize that practically speaking, I know this is unethical, but if you if you hire somebody and you were to say, well, are you a Christian? You know, and, and they say, oh yeah, that should be a box you check and go, oh, this is good. This is somebody we should hire. Christians should be the best employees. Why? Because we have the greatest boss. We work and labor to worship him and honor him and everything that we do. So beloved, if you're a follower of Jesus, allow your life, allow your work to be redeemed and reflect the value of work that God has placed to those around you. Be a light for Christ in the way that you work and labor in such a way where you honor him and glorify him and long for the day when you can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for just this morning and for your word and for the reminder we have about work. This is one of those topics that for so many of us, we maybe don't think about or put enough thought into regarding how we work or our attitude toward work or our approach toward work. But Lord, your word is clear that this is a big deal. It's a major portion of our life. So Lord, I pray that right now your spirit would just work in us this transformation that we would be clothed with Christ and we would begin to change the way that we work, that we could hit the reset button this morning and really approach work from a way that honors you above all else. So Lord, help us with that this morning. And for the person in the room who came here, and maybe they came because their issue isn't a work issue directly. Maybe it's a relationship issue or maybe it's a financial issue, whatever it was, whatever it is. Maybe it's a faith issue. I pray that they would continue to to join us through this series and that, Lord, that somehow by this amazing promise that you made, that your word will accomplish what you desire and achieve the purpose for which you sent it, that, Lord, they come here when they hear you, not my voice, but when they hear you through your revealed word, through scripture, and through the power of your spirit who's drawing them to yourself, Lord, I pray that they would be changed that you would help them transform their life, give them new life, eternal life, and help them to hit the reset button in whatever area of life is a struggle. We ask and pray for that. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the work that you've accomplished in the sending your son Jesus. That's the greatest work, the most important work ever, ever accomplished. And we thank you that Jesus said it is finished. And let's rest in that and trust in that and labor for your glory. It's in your name we pray, in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.